Welcome to Reinventing Parking, the podcast about parking policy for anyone who wants a better city and better urban transport. Welcome back. I'm your host, Paul Barter. Reinventing Parking this time is an edited version of a recent Parking Reform Network webinar, The Inside Story of Oregon's Big Parking Reforms. The state of Oregon recently enacted the most aggressive statewide parking reforms in the United States. This reform requires jurisdictions in the state's eight largest metropolitan areas to eliminate or greatly reduce parking requirements. You'll hear from two panelists. First up is Evan Manvel, who was a key architect of the reforms and is climate mitigation planner for the state of Oregon. And the second panelist is Katie Gould, who's been on the podcast twice already. She's a researcher at the excellent Sightline Institute, which is an environmental think tank that focuses on the Cascadia region of North America. In various places, you'll also hear from the moderator, Rachel Weinberger, who is a PRN advisory group member and the Peter W. Herman Chair for Transportation with the Regional Planning Association in the New York City metropolitan region. The event was sponsored by Studio Davis, which is a leading firm focused on parking policy, systems and management. Let's get on with it. The focus of this episode of Reinventing Parking is an event that was hosted by PRN, Parking Reform Network. And so to get us warmed up before we move into the event itself, I've got uh, Tony Jordan, president of the Parking Reform Network, to have a quick chat about what's been happening with the Parking Reform Network. Hi, Tony. Tell us uh, what's going on with Parking Reform Network just in the last few weeks that uh, the listeners might uh, might find interesting and encouraging. Well. I've been traveling a bit. I went to Dallas uh, and spoke to several planners and, and other stakeholders in Dallas and Dallas area about parking reforms. I went to Bellingham, Washington and gave a talk about parking reform. And I was just down in Los Angeles where we had a big parking reform party with Don Shoup and many other academics and activists, partly celebrating the Assembly Bill 2097 that was uh, passed to um, prohibit cities from mandating parking near transit in the entire state of California. Mm, very encouraging. And this episode is about statewide reforms in Oregon, of course. So we've got these two big recent precedents for statewide reforms, which is very encouraging. And this, this momentum on um, elimination of mandates, we've got some statewide progress, but also cities all over North America seem to be... Uh, joining the club. Is that right? Yeah, literally just an hour ago. So it's the 24th of October right now. And an hour ago, Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, became <laughs> the latest city to completely, completely eliminate their parking requirements. I believe this week, Culver City, California is probably going to have their second reading and officially do it. I can barely even keep up because I've been traveling. Something happened in Gainesville, Florida. And yeah, it's, it's really, it's the the abolishing of parking mandates definitely has some speed, some momentum behind it happening right now. <laughs> yes, and I was, I was going to tell the listener that um, if they wanted to keep up with that, um, there's an excellent article by Katie Gould, who actually features in this episode. It's on the Lincoln Institute website, and she, she gives what was, as of about a week ago, the most up-to-date record or the most up-to-date uh, update <laughs> on the the abolition of parking mandates around uh, North America. And uh, what you said, she's already out of date, but it's nearly right. up to date, her article. <laughs> well, in our parking mandates map, you know, we update that at least about once a month, we try to. So um, hopefully by, I'm guessing next week, some point. Um, so by the time this, a little after this podcast comes out, we'll mm -hmm. update those cities and it will be, you know, as current as we can keep it uh, with yeah. our capacity. Yeah. yeah. Capacity. Yeah. So the momentum is building. The need for help on parking reform is increasing. And as cities abolish their mandates, then they're going to need help on the other elements of parking reform, like parking benefit districts, getting their on-street parking management up to scratch. Um, yes. That leads us nicely into the next part of our conversation, which was uh, the fundraising that you mentioned. Um, we really need funds so we can actually employ people to help cities not just in North America, but all over the world. Right. Yeah. We have a, our, our parking reform network is planning to develop some, some programs for next year that are really aimed at providing 
advocates with the resources they need, including um, continuing the things we're doing with research and providing research, but also specifically programs designed to help planners and advocates implement the other parts of parking reform, on-street parking pricing and management, parking benefit districts and revenue allocation, and just plain education, especially with these statewide reforms, you're asking, you know, in bigger cities, there's been education and reform going on, but in a lot of cities in California and even in Oregon, there hasn't been anyone that's really gone out and tried to tell people from our perspective, a very progressive story about parking reform. And so I think that that there's a big need to continue this. So we also want to provide a bit of a speaker bureau and some training so that you know, yeah. everyone wants Donald Chup to come talk to their town, but Donald Chup is one man. Uh, and so we need to to be um, building up our ranks because the demand for good parking education is growing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the network is already valuable for anyone out there considering joining. Um, if you join, even now, there's an enormous amount of peer-to-peer learning going on in the Slack and uh, via other channels and the, the, the monthly uh, get-togethers that, that you host, Tony. Um, so even now, it's worthwhile joining, but all of that takes organization, and uh, we would like to improve our game in terms of helping out anyone who's considering parking reform and parking management improvement. So yeah, donations yes. are very much welcome and membership uh yeah please join check, so check out the website we you can hear we can learn about the organization there's links all over it uh anyone if you make a contribution you'll get an invitation to join and if you're a student or a organization that you know doesn't have the funds there's a way for you to join as well and, and we want to okay. keep growing the membership this is a podcast but uh i can see you on video here and uh you've got a hat on tony tell us about yeah. that hat quickly we've got we're starting to make more merchandise and and you know i think there's a little bit of demand for for people to show you know that they're they're in this exclusive <laughs> and cool club of a parking reformer somewhere in a parking reform network hat um and yeah we're the website's parkingreform.org if you didn't know already okay thanks tony and now we'll we'll move on and uh, hear about Oregon's statewide parking reforms and uh, how they did it and what they did and why you should care even if you're not in Oregon. Yeah, hi folks, my name is Evan Manvel. So the first thing to understand about Oregon's parking reforms is that they are part of a larger administrative rulemaking called the Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities Rules. So there were other pieces of that some zoning for denser housing, some updated transportation planning standards, EV charging, and some regional plans to meet climate goals. So they're part of something bigger. And all of those rules apply in Oregon's eight metro areas where most Oregonians live and where most of the jobs are. Now, probably the most impactful part of the rules are the prohibition on minimum parking requirements or parking parking mandates near frequent transit starting at the January 1st. So that's within three quarters of a mile of rail stops, half a mile of frequent transit corridors. This focus on transit, as I think you all know, is really intuitive to decision makers. And, you know, it's the place a lot of reforms have gone is really, hey, people get that if you live near decent transit, you can have less parking. And it's also the stuff that that has shown in King County's right size parking project to have the most impact. Local builders are most likely to build less parking there. So it's a really good fit. And that's why a big thrust of the rules was that. What it means on the ground, communities uh, tasked with implementing these rules that were adopted in July are developing these maps as they go. And you can see Milwaukee, a Portland suburb, all the stuff in gray won't have parking mandates. In Gresham, which is another Portland suburb, fourth largest community in Oregon. All the stuff in light green is near rail and the stuff in dark green is near good good bus transit. So it may mean for a few communities, 0% of their land. For some communities, it's up to 95% of their land. So it's a lot of areas that won't have parking mandates. The other piece that happens January 1st is some equity uses won't have parking mandates anymore. And so that's affordable housing, public housing, small units, SROs, childcare, shelters, folks for people with disabilities. And there's a cap that comes in. Cities will no longer be able to mandate more than one space per unit for multifamily housing. So 
people can still build it, but cities can't mandate it. So those are the big thrusts that happened January 1st. Cities have a little longer to do some other things in the parking reforms. And the reforms kind of have three pieces. The first is implementing best practices for kind of the wonky details in parking code. The second is choose one of three paths to do parking reform for the city overall, not just those areas near transit. And for the most populous communities, they have to do more parking management. What does that look like in practice? So all the communities have to do these things. They have to adopt code provisions that promote shared parking, repurpose underused parking. There's some provisions for parking lots that are larger than a quarter acre. They either have to do tree canopy or solar panels, and they have to allow redevelopment of parking for certain uses. There is a requirement for some EV conduit to be installed for 40% of parking spaces. And there's a, a nod to parking maximums in those key areas in the larger population cities, over 25,000 in, in the Portland metro area and over 100,000 elsewhere. There are a couple of really wonky things that only apply to the city of Portland right now. Just say, hey, let's think about some other things before we're building new public parking garages. The three reform options, the kind of three paths this is what they are. The first is a simple approach, and that's just repealing parking mandates citywide. And that's what we as a state agency have the authority to tell people to do. But we say, hey, in lieu of doing that, if you don't, if you're not ready for that or don't don't want to do that, take one of these other two paths. The first we call fair pricing, fair policy. And that's saying, here are five different policies you can do. Choose at least three of them residential and commercial unbundling, where folks can pay for their parking separate from their rent. And if they don't want it, they can opt out. Flexible commute benefits or parking cash out for employers of over 50 people. Tax on commercial parking lots or reducing that multifamily mandate down to a half space per unit or below. So three of those five. And the third path is just, all right, neither of those work for you. Let's figure out some other things that parking mandates sometimes get in the way of. Larger areas near climate friendly areas, studios, one bedrooms, historic, com small commercial under 3,000 square feet, bars, taverns, green developments, vacant buildings. And we say cities, you have to choose at least some area and do a tiny bit of parking management. So use that muscle, learn that muscle. So that's, that's the third option that cities have in complying with these rules. There are a few other things. If cities are choosing one of those two second paths, option two or option three, you can't require ping pong rooms or as some people call them, garages. So you can't require garage spaces not to count as parking spaces, even though sometimes people do make them into ping pong rooms. You have to allow offsite parking and you reduce parking mandates for various things that are good for climate or equity, solar, car sharing, EV, accessible housing for people with disabilities, that sort of thing. And you have to unbundle your parking, again, pay for it separately for multifamily in those transit corridors that are lined out in the rules. Now, for the seven most populous communities in Oregon, over 100,000, they choose an approach. The first is to take option one and waive all their parking mandates for new development. And the second is, all right, if you think parking is so valuable that you want to continue to mandate it, you have to price some of the on-street parking. And that's 5% of on-street parking spaces in about a year and 10% in three years from now. And it can't just be, hey, here's a $10 a year residential permit. It has to be something that's at least 50 cents a day and sends a small price signal. So that would be about $180 a year, which is higher than a lot of residential permits in Oregon, but not all. So yeah. It, that kind of forces them to make a harder choice than they might otherwise make. So cities are now faced with kind of this, this decision, which of the three paths. The first one starts to look pretty darn simple compared to the other two, but we are seeing some, some communities think, oh, they're gonna go on the third path. We're not yet seeing people go on the second path, but those are the paths and, and how they line out. So that's an overview of the reforms. There is a longer overview, uh, an hour and a half on our website, and you can dig into them in the four pages of rules themselves on our website. The rules were adopted as part of Oregon's land use and transportation planning system. We're unique in the country. Other states have different varieties of this, but 
Oregon's pretty proud of our land use planning program that's almost 50 years old. The legislature created that program and they passed land use laws. They also created a department, which I work for, and a commission that oversees our department to implement the planning program. And they adopt rules and goals that the local plans must meet. Local governments then go and adopt their comp plans and development codes and transportation system plans. This picture, the people circled are six of the seven members of our commission. The rest are staff. And I circle them because one of the reasons this reform was effective and possible was because these people are experts in their field. They are people who have a lot of expertise in development, in affordable housing development, in equity issues, in local government policy. They're people who work in those places or have served in those places. And they're really knowledgeable and, and interested and engaged. And they think about a lot of these things. They might dream about parking like some of us, but if not, they are at least sophisticated and, and knowledgeable. Now the rules were adopted, took a two year process, and we had something called the Rulemaking Advisory Committee that advised us as, as we developed them. And it was the largest and most diverse rulemaking advisory committee in our department's history. It was 40 people. And it wasn't just the traditional folks we've invited, the local governments and home builders and realtors and a conservation advocate or two. It brought in a more diverse set of folks, people with real experience in equity and real experience in being a part of a marginalized community, people with disabilities, people of color, people run it, representing people of homelessness. So it really brought folks who were interested in a change in the status quo to the table. And it brought those people and said, hey, the status quo might be working for those folks we've often had around the table, but let's think about things again. So they really guided us through a series of 12 meetings and other conversations as we developed various rules and it was super valuable. Now we started with that group saying, what outcomes do we want from this rulemaking? And then we took the next steps and we said, all right, parking reform really fits with climate and equity goals, housing choices, walking, biking, transit, all these things. And we kind of laid it out, shared the research. Folks agreed that it can really do these things that are on the slide. And so had a fair amount of buy-in, not uniform buy-in from all 40 members, but a fair amount of buy-in for doing substantial parking reform. And then we led them through and said, hey, all right, what are the pieces of parking reform? Let's reduce parking mandates. Let's help internalize costs because car ownership and driving correlates pretty well with privilege. Let's address the negative impacts of excessive parking and think about some key areas we want to put in some parking maximums and really encourage communities to use management, not the heavy handed one size fits all unpriced supply that has caused so many problems in the past. We said, okay, some, some, some of these are types, some of these are places we want to do reform. We should provide cities some options and some choices and see if we can get to the place where people who aren't using parking aren't subsidizing those who are. So I am now going to turn the microphone to Katie. Sure, my name is Katie Gould and I'm a transportation researcher with Sightline Institute. We're a nonprofit sustainability think tank focused on the Pacific Northwest. I've been based out of Portland for the last 10 years and I like to tell people that I do own a car and I usually park on the street. I'll add another piece of context that made a difference for us in supporting and kind of feeling optimistic about this rulemaking package was when House Bill 2001 was adopted by the Oregon legislature, which is our middle housing bill, a court found that requiring more than one parking spot, I think was considered like an excessive burden. So there was a little precedent that had been recent saying that we can have like statewide regulatory action against parking mandates. So I think it was during 2021 that we kind of heard, I think through Tony or through the Parking Reform Network that Evan was working on these three parking paths, us being sightline. <laughs> and we ended up publishing 10 different stories on parking requirements up to the lead up of these rules being finally adopted. And we were able to tell some stories uh, locally about how parking mandates are impacting affordable housing in your neighborhood, how they're affecting urban heat islands, but also tell some stories about maybe small cities like uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, that had already repealed their parking requirements and what their experience was like. And our goal was to help educate the public so we can have this kind of wide variety of public support of people who support lifting parking mandates for different reasons. And we were able to kind of assemble a coalition of 
interested groups to support this. So I think, Evan, you have a slide of all the organizations that ended up doing this. And part of the, you know, the, our critical role in publishing this is it took a long time for this to show up in the news. I don't think it was until May that the OPB had a story about this upcoming reform. So a lot of this happens with kind of the advocacy network communications, these things that aren't, <laughs> aren't uh, front page news. And OPB is the Oregon Public Broadcasting for those not in Oregon. So does that fairly cover the what's in the reform and how it was passed? There was a decision point on whether the Portland metro re region was going to be exempt from the parking mandates reform or not. And it was really the advocates leaning in and, and pushing to make sure that those roughly half the jurisdictions impacted by these reforms were included in those reforms. There's kind of a, a unique role for the metro regional government, but we decided the parking reform was more urgent than waiting for several years for the metro region to adopt it separately. But why don't you go on ahead with what's next in Oregon, and then Katie can right. talk to us about what's likely to happen regarding yeah. development. So. Thank you. So what's happening now? These rules were adopted in July. The local governments are working on how to implement them. And there are pretty short timelines for long-range planners. And so they're like, oh my gosh, it's so fast. I, I, as an advocate, I'm like, this is not fast enough. We've got a climate crisis. So cities are having those conversations. They're building these maps. They're saying, what are the implications for our community? And a lot of the larger cities are leaning towards the path one, the repealing all parking mandate. And another city of Medford in Southern Oregon is choosing path three. So they're making those decisions the state is leaning out a lot of guidance and help and kind of technical like office hours, like this is what this line of the rules means and this is what we read this to mean and this is what happens when you don't follow the rules and, you know, all these questions. So we're doing a lot of partnership with our local jurisdictions in implementing these and making sure that starting January 1st that they're they're good and they understand what, what's required of them and then the later decision that's due at the end of June. So doing some road tripping and things like that. Beyond that, there are a couple of wild cards. One is there are a few communities that are considering a petition for legal review, that they think that they, we don't have the authority to do this, and or some other, some other legal concept. We don't know because they haven't filed it yet, but there are about six to 10 communities of the of the 51 impacted who are doing that. Other communities totally supported this rule. The rules may still be, are, are, will still be in effect until a court deems them not to be in effect. And if they find there's a flaw, we might fix that flaw and readopt the rules. I don't know. The other big wild card is, of course, the Oregon legislature and that we have a very heated governor's race going on. And those elected officials may overturn or redirect or do something else on this uh, to be determined. Obviously, it's a contentious issue. But so, so yeah, now, now the battle is moving to potentially the courts and potentially the legislature. And our commission may, may adopt some small amendments and tweaks as well. They were clear when they adopted. They said, hey, if things appear during implementation that we need to tweak, let us know. So we're very open, open-eared on that. The jurisdictions are talking amongst, amongst themselves, saying, "Which path are you taking? What are you doing? How are you doing this?" And they're kind of the ones who are boldly leading. There are a lot of communities that are going to the no mandates. They're like, "Oh, you're doing that? Okay, we, we feel comfortable. We're doing that too." So, we'll we'll see what happens. Katie, do you want to add to? No, I mean okay. we can talk next about developments. So I have a lot of conversations with city planners in places that have already gotten rid of their parking requirements. And something that I hear over and over is that lifting parking mandates is not going to change all of your development overnight. They're seeing a lot of developers still building just as much parking as before, but for a handful of properties and certain types of properties, these rules really benefit, right? And some of those categories, affordable housing, where people just don't own cars at the same rate as kind of average parking demand, also adapting buildings to new uses, older buildings or buildings that are on small lots specifically. Those are kind of some of the first type of properties that have seen to be redeveloped after these rules change in cities. There's a good study from Seattle that showed that 70% of 
developers that they didn't have to build parking anymore near frequent transit. They still built some parking. And then Buffalo had a really good study of 36 developments in the two years after the green code was adopted that more than half of the new projects still built parking as if there were parking minimums still in place. But almost half of the developers built less and got to build a lot of new homes and businesses because of that. So those are the kind of zoning is a very slow change. There's not a lot of urgent changes in street management that these cities have done, but in the kind of five, 10 year time frame, we'll probably see more of that. So for people who are not in Oregon, do you have any words of wisdom? What are the key things that you had in place other than the statewide land planning commission that, that would help, you know, politically, education wise, in terms of the community, how, how can other places apply what you've done? What obstacles were there to overcome and, you know, what wants to be in place in order to to make this bumpy road a little bit smoother. I often talk to communities about parking reform and say it's kind of like, think of it maybe as a hot tub, like where you <laughs> you think it's really going to be awful and then you slowly get in and then you realize, oh, that wasn't painful. That's actually kind of nice. I'm going to get a little further. Okay, I'm going to get a little further. Okay, that's really nice. And it's not the frog boiling in its own water. It's like, okay, this is going to be really pleasant. So I encourage communities that are struggling with this to, to do it incrementally. City of Salem waived it for one development downtown, uh, like 148 units and 14 parking spaces. And they were like, oh, that worked. Let's waive it for all of downtown and around transit corridors. And oh, we're updating our multifamily code. So let's update it for those and waive it for multifamily and duplexes and triplexes and quadplexes. So it can take six months or a year after each reform to like realize that the sky doesn't fall because it's really a fear of the unknown that's stopping people from doing this and thinking suddenly they won't be able to park anywhere. And I don't, I don't really understand. Like, But that's the fear. And that happened at the state level too, as Katie mentioned. Like there was some state, there were some state laws the legislature passed saying you can't require parking for granny flats for accessory dwelling units. And the state agency had also done this traditional middle missing housing parking reform of like for duplexes and triplexes and quads. So, so number one, ease into it if people are really scared of it. You don't have to jump into the deep end to start. Number two, really try to make the conversation about something besides parking. Make it about housing, generally, generally right now. Like we called ours climate friendly and equitable communities. That was about climate and equity, but it also became about housing. If you're updating your multifamily housing code or you're like realizing what's your problem in your community, as Tony Jordan likes to say, like parking reform might not fix everything, but it'll get in the way of meeting a lot of your goals. So so make it about something besides parking. Have it have a different context. Non-elected bodies can be really helpful if you have one. You know, maybe it's your housing authority, maybe it's your environmental commission, maybe it's your planning commission, maybe it's somebody else. Because one of the things that happens as I've worked in parking reform around Oregon is both city staff and city councilors are like, you know what people complain to me about more than anything else, it's parking. And so ideally you line up the right effective city councilors and city staff who are who are willing to take some more gruff. But if you can find a non-elected body, you know, they, that might be a good buffer. Like a lot of local governments are like, hey, the state is making us do this. Like the local government's like, thank you. But you know, there, there is that back and forth. So we as a non-elected body were able to go pretty aggressively after this, whereas elected body would probably take several more steps or you know might might do the more incremental approach and last night in the city of beaverton someone was like ah, this is something we might have gotten to but not as quickly and the last thing again something a mayor of beaverton brought up last night was like hey i was just talking to the mayor of des moines and said how are you doing all this great development downtown and he said well, we repealed parking requirements. <laughs> so, so, so it was very much like peer-to-peer -peer learning of like, okay, this this is important. The sky doesn't fall. It's not as scary as it seems, because a lot of this is just about fear. So, th those are those are a few of my thoughts, Katie. Yeah, there certainly is like a growing precedent for statewide action. Also, I think a month after Oregon's reform, California finally passed 
AB 2097 repealing parking mandates near transit in some circumstances. But like, right, because of those couple things, right, we have legislators from Washington calling in to say, hey, could we do a statewide parking reform bill like this as well? So I'm sure that will happen in more places and it's a really good use of time, right, to affect just a lot more cities for maybe the same amount of effort and to get those like varied stories coming from different corners of the states and different types of towns. I would say for us, I think I always noticed a very clear shift in like the meeting when someone was telling a, a personal story about how parking requirements in their city affected their development where they weren't able to build the homes they wanted or they weren't able to open a business easily. That made a real impact and tons of people have those stories out there. But I think that was some of our most impactful testimony. And, you know, kind of a lot of cities are having these conversations right now about, well, what do we do with the new work from home life? How do we energize downtown? What are we going to do with all this vacant office space that we think is maybe never going to come back, right? Getting rid of parking mandates is one very easy thing that costs a place almost nothing to do that just allows reuse of that building without parking getting in the way. And that's something we've known a long time. That was sort of the premise of the of the Boulder Parking Benefit District way back in the in the 1970s. Katie, how did you manage 1,600 organizations uh, as a as a supporting coalition? And well, I'm going to say of- this has got to be 1,600 signatures. Otherwise, that'd be news to me. Well, <laughs> maybe our letter. I think uh, we had 35. Oh yeah. yeah. You're right. <laughs> I'm just saying. I certainly did not talk to 1,600 organizations personally. All but right. Yeah, so, so, t- talk about that a little bit. Like, was it organizations getting their peers on board? Was it a central organizing effort and building a big list and clawing through it? T- talk. Can you? Yeah, those advocacy coalitions are pretty important in in all kinds of areas, and it would be great if you had some insight on how to build that, how to manage that. So forth. yeah. Well, there's a broad pretty broad base of organizations that like parking affects them. Parking affects everything, right? Whether you care about environmental quality, preserving farms and forest land to affordable housing developers, right? To climate activists who want to see us drive less. But yeah, I mean, a lot of this was spreading through word of mouth and making phone calls. Yeah, it it certainly was helpful to have like downtown associations as well as affordable housing folks, as well as equity folks, as well as some local governments, as well as, you know, just kept going. Like my my colleagues at after the hearings was saying, like, how the heck, where did these parking reformers come from? (laughs) And kudos to Katie and Tony and, and everyone else who organized, but in hearing after hearing after hearing, parking reformers showed up. And that was that was really critical and that all the different dimensions and the people impacted by costly parking mandates were making the case and really driving it home and providing the political cover for probably the general instinct of commissioners anyway. But it really made it easier to say, yeah, local governments, we know this is some hard work and this is a hard decision, but we've got all these folks who are really pushing us forward. So, you know, we took a fair a fair number of amendments from local governments and tweaks, but we also kind of held to our core direction. So it was it was super impressive from the staff's perspective on on what the advocates pulled together. So speaking of the advocates, one of the questions that arose was this is around this idea that not all of the advocates are on board with the idea that parking minimums are problematic. But what would you say to address something like that, you know, this sort of conflict among the advocates or the environmentalists even as to, I mean, I know in the New York state environmental law, parking spaces are considered a protected resource, you know, just one of the many perversities that we all live with. But if you can't get the progressive reformers to agree that parking minimums are potentially problematic, then how do you get the right kind of buy-in or how do you how do you hold that conversation? I think how I try to think about this issue, some people kind of start from the baseline of thinking that however much parking the government requires is the right amount. That is the correct amount of parking, which I like no longer believe. I don't know any city that's done as a, like a survey of their off-street parking occupancy that's been close to full, 
we apply mm -hmm. these one size fits all requirements on all new buildings, regardless of a lot of different contexts or their clientele or their business needs. And even if people own cars at a rate that you think is like about average for a parking requirement, there's going to be a lot of individual property owners that that parking ratio is not going to work for them. So a lot of places when they do these studies, they find that we have a lot more parking than we need. We have a lot of parking that never gets used. Maybe one in every four spots that the city requires never gets used, even at peak hour. So sometimes cities are able to collect that information. They have funds to do that type of work. But even if you don't, I mean, it's easy to go out and take some pictures of parking lots during the busiest times of day and say, right, it's easy to see that there's more parking in some places than there needs to be. Yeah, not to plug for my past, but in my own research, on, on average, parking is oversupplied by 60%. So another question that I think I might not have thought of, but is there any concern that communities that are trying to avoid having to, to take on the new rules, would they be looking to prevent more frequent transit since that would trigger rules? Yeah, it's certainly a question we asked ourselves. Luckily, generally, transit providers are, are separate entities. Like there are a few local governments in Oregon that operate the transit systems. And we haven't seen any communities actually do that. Like I, I think that that would be like there are a very various ways to trickily try to eke out of some of the rules, but I think they're generally more work than they're worth. Now, there there may be come a point where communities aren't complying with the rules and there's some tension <coughs> both and we don't want to just have a bunch of appeals from developers and builders. So We'll have to work through those. We have a long history of working through conflicts with local governments in various ways, but pe people aren't getting super tricky. <laughs> so that actually cues up another question, which is if the home rule paradigm has impacted these rules, and if so, how, and is that a source of potential legal challenge? So, yeah, no one likes to be told what to do by somebody else. Like, we get that <laughs> as a state. Like, just nobody, I don't like it. Nobody likes it except maybe to provide political cover, as I talked about earlier. So whether that plays into a legal challenge or not, we don't know. We, we, we think we adopted the rules per our statutory authority and various other things and think that, yeah, but we have not yet to see any potential challenges, so, so we can't evaluate those. All right. Stay tuned, I guess, on that one. And, and one thing I would bring up in, in response to your previous question, Climate advocacy, like I'm like, okay, the government should get off its foot off the gas when it comes to making people drive more. <laughs> like, and parking mandates are putting our foot on the gas. So if we're trying to put our foot on the brake, like, let's get our foot off that gas to start. But generally, what I see, the challenge I, I've been seeing as I've been talking in local decision makers is they have their picture in the mind of an older person with lots of kids walking in the rain who's poor and is working three jobs and oh my gosh how can we suffer them without a parking space like that 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 is their story that is their availability heuristic of like okay i'm going to picture someone this would harm and that's that's a a harder thing to get through and then you kind of talk about okay what if that person was all that and didn't drive and was paying for parking for people who were <laughs> how do we get our minds off of who's going to be harmed by this and who is harmed by the current system. So that that's really one of the challenges in the local conversations is not so much the advocates, but the decision makers who are struggling with getting their minds around it. And so I, I you know, try to talk through it and try to talk through all the equity organizations that are supporting it and all that. But you all know this is an easy conversation. So. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, that corresponds to your point earlier about, you know, having having stories. So I'm sorry, Katie, I interrupted you. Oh yeah, I'm constantly reminding other advocates that I meet with to, to drill in the message that ending parking requirements doesn't end parking, doesn't end construction, new parking. It doesn't mean that you have to, anyone has to stop driving. Everyone can still drive the same amount. All it means is that instead of a half empty parking lot, hopefully the new parking lots are only gonna be, you know, 20% empty. That the market is judging the size of the parking lot and not the government. It doesn't, <laughs> in the long term, we would love people to drive less, but in the short term, that's not, what's going to happen. And now you have the anecdotes of Buffalo and Seattle to, to show how that works. So another question 
Did any of the communities impacted already have TDM programs that had to change as a result of the new rules? Or is it too soon to tell? There are some TDM programs adopted in the Portland metro area. There's our Department of Environmental Quality has something that called the Employer Commute Options Program. And so there may be some overlapping of those programs. And, and there are some local TDM efforts, but I'm I'm not yet convinced that any city has to completely tweak its TDM efforts. Like in theory, if they choose option two, they would probably have to tweak it because there aren't parking cash out efforts at $50 level at the city level in Oregon. So they would have to tweak those. If someone wants to do that, great. We want it, we want to do that because we think option two, the pricing signals are the most impactful. And we tried to make that somewhat simple, but planners don't necessarily think about policies like, oh, that's not, how do you fit that in a zoning code? And it's like, it doesn't fit. <laughs> so we've seen some kind of structural nervousness about path two, and that's been too bad. So I, I'm not aware of any cities that's going to have to change its TDM efforts, but we'd, ha we'd happily work with them on that. So here, here's a follow-up, to Katie, to what you were saying about oversupply of parking. Do we have any data on occupancy in private residential parking? Yeah. I'm trying to think of an Oregon specific example, but yeah, Brian put in Just think of any of, example. Let's blow this out of Oregon a little bit if yeah, you can. Yeah. There was one study. So this is single family housing, but there was one study out of LA that 75% of homeowners with garages couldn't fit their cars in their garage, right? It's filled up with stuff and they couldn't fit their car. That was too. like one of the most extremes, but there's like different rates that this happens. You know, even if you have an off-street parking space, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to use it. The west end of Vancouver, they went through kind of a policy change around this where their streets were super congested, even though there were more off-street parking spaces than there were cars registered to people living in that neighborhood, right? But the street parking was a lot cheaper, right? So after the city kind of adjusted their prices of the permits, and also installed parking meters on streets that didn't have any before, right? That's how they were able to make free up some on-street parking spaces for people needing to come in and out of the district during the day. It wasn't by requiring more off-street parking spaces. Evan, one question that I did miss, in your early remarks, you mentioned the right size parking project, and I'm assuming that's King County Metro, but also yeah. an area they're doing as well. So can you just explain that project for the benefit of the district? Yeah, so, so the King County right size project, right size parking project, gosh, I feel like it was the mid 2000s they did it in. Is that correct? Yeah. It was funded by federal highways and it was one of the most sophisticated efforts of looking at what drove parking demand. And they did a really nice regression analysis on kind of, hey, what, what are the best predictors of how much parking is going to be built? And transit frequency was a huge driver. Overall density was another huge driver. And some of the other things that planners traditionally have done to create these random parking mandates are not very good predictors. So what that what that did, they then did a lot of maps and said, hey, based on where you are, this is how much parking we predict you you'll need. And they reformed their parking mandates and then builders build eighteen thousand less parking spaces and the region saved a half billion dollars in not doing that. But I don't know, Rachel, if you have other things to add to that since you're familiar with it. That pretty well sums it. And just to say that it has been picked up in, in a couple of other jurisdictions, Boston area. I know there's somebody's doing it there. I don't know where else. And it was also assisted in its development by the Chicago Center for Neighborhood Technology. So it's a, a good partner in that. This was a, a program brought to you by the Parking Reform Network, an organization I'm proud to be affiliated with. And, and very big thanks to, to Katie and Evan for their thoughts and, and, and organizing their thoughts in a way that, that's so helpful and, and enlightening for us. You've been listening to the Reinventing Parking podcast, and I'm Paul Barter. You can find out more at reinventingparking.org, where you'll find ideas and tips on parking policy. You can also listen to other episodes, subscribe, or leave a comment. That's reinventingparking.org. Bye for now.